Connected Podcast at FL Fuller Landau, Montreal. My name is Euro Smilikic. I'm your host, and I'm accompanied today by our managing partner, Mr. Michael Newton. Mike, I'll let you introduce yourself in a second. Today, we're going to be talking about how to value your business using what Mike calls the napkin method. So we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, Mike, you go ahead and give the viewers a brief introduction about yourself. Thanks, Euros. Um as, as, as you're aware, I've been here since 1989, started as a summer, summer student back in uh, uh, eons ago. I'm not sure if you were actually born yet at that oh, time. Oh, I was. So yeah, I was, I, was, I was just moving to Canada. Or I was going to say yeah. just moving into diapers. So uh, <laughs> I started here in 89, uh, full-time in 90, became a partner in uh, 1998, went through the traditional a and type uh, audit and accounting uh, paths. Um, I figured that uh, if I was going to stay in a and I either needed to have a frontal lobotomy or... Uh, possibly uh, take some serious medication. So I decided to look and see what uh, turned me on, I guess, more so in the, in the professional world. Um, I had done a double major in accounting and finance uh, when I was at McGill, and certainly that whole exercise on the finance side is always something that's intrigued me. Part of that uh, revolves around financing, uh, revolves around the valuation of a business. Mm -hmm. So uh, as time progressed, I kind of got into this very napkin approach of, of trying to look at business deals looking at opportunities, seeing a uh, big picture in terms of, uh, of where I, I want to see things. I've also used it internally. I became managing partner in 2004. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done about seven acquisitions on our side. So, you know, it, it's, it's something that, that has been used on, on a multitude of, of occasions. The reality is um, valuation formally is a very long and, uh, I don't want to say arduous, but there's a lot of information that goes into it. Uh, my approach is really ballparking just to try and get a feel of whether uh, when I sit down to talk to somebody or a client sits down to talk to somebody, whether we're in the same ballpark. or right, if someone is serious or, or not, it helps 100%. you weed out. Yeah, and it's also to make sure that when I sit down with somebody and I know my client wants to spend, you know, $4 million on a business, right. that uh, I don't hit the first set of numbers and say, hey, wait a second, you know, this guy is, uh, you thought you were going to pay four and it's really a $20 million business. So by no means is the cocktail napkin approach a scientific approach. It does take into account a lot of the factors, a lot of the issues that over the years uh, and through the formal evaluation process you will take into account of, uh, but it really is more of a ballpark to ensure at the end of the day I know whether I'm looking at a million dollars, ten million dollars, or, or somewhere in that vicinity. Exactly, and I think very well sa said, Mike, and I, I think what's important from what you said there too, it doesn't replace uh, a formal valuation Correct. that may or may not <laughs> need to be done uh, at some point down the road if you are seriously looking at selling your business. It just helps uh, the, the seller potentially educate themselves uh, with w what they're working with. Yeah, I mean, I, funny enough, I use it more on the buy side than I do on the sell side. Okay. Uh, the buy side is really to get myself, when I sit down across the table from a potential seller, you know, to, to get a feel for whether he's really or she's really out to lunch in the value of her business. We all okay. know that entrepreneurs think their business is worth a lot more than it really is. Just like selling uh, a home. 100%. Right, yeah. it, it becomes personal. And unfortunately, that personal component doesn't find its way into a pricing model. So I like to sit down. It certainly can be done on uh, on a sales side as well. Uh, though, the, you know, the reality of the sales side is going to be driven by the market mm -hmm. as much as it is going to be what I think my company is worth. What it may do is it may bring me down to earth a little bit in terms of where mm -hmm. I am if I'm selling to say, hey, wait a second, I thought this was worth 10, but really it's only worth five. Right, right. So here's what I'd like to do for, for myself and for the viewers. If you could shed light on, on the scenario that I'm going to bring forth. Um, I'm going to throw out some numbers there. I'm going to try to keep them brief. Um, I'm going to give you a description, a short, very short description of a company that say I own personally, mm -hmm. private company. Essentially, I'm going to give you top line. I'm not going to go too much into detail. And I want you to really, I guess, take a step back and do this magic trick, if you will. Um, and and we'll, we'll all be amazed by it. So let's get started. Say I own a company called UM Inc. And I have top line sales of $2.5 mm -hmm. My gross profit is a $1 million. I have expenses of 800000 so essentially, my net income before taxes, we're looking at 200000 mm -hmm. Now, I'll let you ask me whatever questions, I guess, that are going to help you do this quick calculation off the top of your head. 
Uh, but that's sort of what I'm working with. Yeah, I feel a little bit like a freak show at the circus right now. I'm going to do this off the top of my head. Um, <laughs> the reality is I, I think what you're looking at here is, is, first of all, you're giving me a set of numbers that uh, represent one year. Okay, If I'm sitting down to look at this, I'm going to take the average of at least three years, if not five, depending on the trends, depending on the sequencing of the mm -hmm. business. The other thing that I'm going to want to consider at the end of the day is working my way back to more of a cash flow type environment than it is from a bottom line net income. We all know that at the end of the day, there are non-cash items such as depreciation or amortization that mm -hmm. find their way into affecting the bottom line, either for financial statement purposes or for tax purposes. They are, however, non-cash items. So usually what we do is we will start from your point of $200,000 of net income. And then I'll start to plus and minus certain items to get to what they call earnings before income tax uh, ah. and, and amortization. So really at the end of the day, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to work from the number on the financials because I now need to spend time going through vetting the numbers, vetting what's there, and determining whether those individual numbers that you have given to us, and I'm going to take your numbers as the average of the last three years just for simplicity purposes. Perfect. Um, very difficult to find any kind of trend or any kind of rationale in a one-year set of numbers. Mm -hmm. um, I can also start looking at, uh, as an aside, if I see this um, trending, okay, I may want to start to weight the numbers on each year based on reality. So if the last couple of years have really been realistic and the four or five years ago weren't, I'm going to assign a, a lower weight to the past years okay. in board of the fund. Really a mathematical type to of To reflect type of what, what the situation is more or less now and in the coming years. Correct. Well, yeah, because yeah, yeah, there's a whole you know discounted cash flow model. There's, right. I mean, you, you, when you, if you ever see a formal valuation, and like I said, if, you, if you're going to go this route, you do need to do it properly. I mean, we have Jean-Francois Oudet who's doing uh, right. our valuations here as, as and we'll a CBV. put we'll put his uh, his information up at the end as well. Perfect, because he is going to prepare the document under various different methods, and you're going to come out with some kind. But for our purposes today, I'm going to go kind of plain and simple. So I'm going to assume that your net income before tax is two hundred thousand dollars. I'm going to add back amortization. So based on the numbers, even though you didn't provide them, I'm going to say it's fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and I am now going to look at my salaries. I'm going to look at those areas that. You know, in many cases, a family business uh, uh, or an individual's business, their salaries are either excessive or not enough. Mm -hmm. They're not at market. Uh, the expenses they put through may be excessive or not enough, right. not necessarily at market. So you now have to take your categories of expenses and you have to look at them and say, if this was a third-party business, is this salary reasonable? So example, you know, the individual's got a $2.5 million business. Uh, he's taking a salary of $400,000, probably not realistic in terms of market. If I was to go out and hire somebody, maybe I'd pay them two and a quarter. Right. So now I've got an excess of $175,000. So you'll add that back. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the 200, I'm going to add the 50 for amortization, I'm going to add the 175 of excess of salary to bring me back to a market. I'm also now going to start to look at uh, long-term debt interest. Okay, interest on a long-term debt is a decision because the company was undercapitalized. Right. So I went to market to get cash. I'm paying an interest component. It as well should be added back. The buyer is going to look at this and they're going to capitalize the business based on the ways they want to, whether they're going to inject equity, whether they're going to inject debt. But the value is before this long-term debt. Component. Understood. So say I have 10000 of that. So you're going to add that back. So we've started with the 200 we have added. 50, right. we've added 175, we've added 10. So basically what have we've done? We've just added $235,000 mm -hmm. to this $200,000 worth of net income. Right. Okay, so now I'm sitting at $435,000. Are there other adjustments? You have to start looking at, again, the trends. It's, a, it's an individual business that has a gross profit uh, of a certain percentage. Okay. In most established businesses, those gross profits should be more or less consistent from year to year. Mm -hmm. If you happen to have a, a, an aberration, if you happen to have a major difference in one year, why? So okay. your job and my job at this scenario is to say, hey, what's the difference? Where do we stand? 
Why is this in there? Is this a recurring item or is this a one-off item? Mm -hmm. If it's a one-off item, I will go down and adjust for it accordingly, same as we just adjusted for. So you would add it back for any. I would add it back, or I would deduct it depending right. on if it's that, income or an expense. Great. I may have had a huge boom in my gross profit one year because I may have discerned I've gone out and bought something at discount and turned around and sold it at full price. But that's not, not something realistic. I normally do. So the whole idea is to come down to a normalized income, something that I can rely on mm -hmm. that is a consistent to market type value that I am then going to take a multiple to. I'm going to add a multiple. The multiple is a is a function of that EBITDA number. Okay, so you depending on your industry, depending on the appetite of the buyer, depending on the country that you may be in, depending on the state of the economy, political, depending on political. Yeah. I mean, your multiples can range anywhere from, you know, one or two times to eight or ten times. American market's a little hungrier than the Canadian market. Their mm -hmm. multiples seem to run a little bit higher okay. than the Canadian market runs. Um, you may have a point and a half to two points differential between the two. For again, the same industry. For and the it same depends. industry. Right. But again, it's a function of you know uh, many, many things. And, and you know the, the, the fear I have when we started talking about doing this today is that we all generalize and say, here's how we get there. We multiply it by four and away we go and there I have right. our business. If you're going to go through this exercise on yourself on a cocktail napkin, you, know, you need to still be doing some research. You need to look at what are the multiples within in your industry? What are your multiples within businesses of similar sizes? What are your multiples if it's a public company versus a private company? So when you start to dig, you recognize that, that, that this, you know, top of the head, uh, top of my head calculation really has to be a ballpark and cannot be relied upon for any significant uh, valuation, costing, putting an offer together. You really need to do your homework properly. But what it does do is it allows me to contextualize mm -hmm where I'm sitting within the marketplace and with the deal. And if I sit down and I do my calcs and I look at it and it's way above what my client is willing to pay or it's way below, at least now I have a direction to go. Okay, and what I'm gonna do is once I get this multiple, once I get this idea of what the value of the company, and let's for argument's sake say that this, this $435,000 has a multiple of four. Okay. Okay, so you're going to end up with a million six, million seven, seven forty. Yeah. Okay, so the value that I'm looking at in this ballpark, again, assuming non-redundant assets, and I can run through a whole finance course worth of other terminology, right. but I'm ballparking it at a million seven forty. So I'm going to say I'm somewhere around a million seven. So I know if the buyer's asking five, there's something I'm missing. Mm -hmm. Okay, or something he's missing. Right. If he's asking two fifty, then Again, I'm in a situation where I'm like, maybe he's lost all his client list. Maybe there's something that we're not aware of. So this really is that, that initial contextualization of where we go from now. It does not replace a full for valuation. It does not replace doing your due diligence work at the end of the day. Because Absolutely, usually yeah. what will end up happening is you'll be provided information. If you're on the buy side, you'll be provided information from clients, from the, from the target. Where did that information come from? So it came from their books, it came from their accountant, it came from their, their you know, you're always going to go in with a little bit of a jaundiced eye because you're going to look at this and you're going to say, hey, wait a sec, this is information you're providing me. Now, what level of report did I get? Did I get an audit report? Did I get a review engagement report? Do right. I have a notice review? You have to assess the credibility of the information you're, Correct. you're evaluating. I'm also going to not only look at the level of the report, I'm going to look at the firm issuing it. Mm. I'd love to say we're all made equal, but the reality is we're, we are not. So I'm going to look at the credibility of the firm that's providing the information. I'm going to look at cash flow projections. I am going to look at a whole bunch of information that I'm going to put together mm -hmm. uh, ultimately at the end of the day to determine that this is where my basis of where I'm starting from. Okay, mm -hmm. And really, this approach that we're talking about is really my starting point. Client walks in and says, I got a great deal. I got this opportunity to buy a business. It's right where I want to be. It's in my geographical space. It's in my you know, wheelhouse in terms of uh, you know, vertical integration. Great, wonderful. Here's what they want for it. And I look at them and go, well, I think maybe you're about four times more than it's worth. Right. So this is a very quick ballpark is what you're saying. But, it, but what it does do is it gives you that ability to quickly put yourself in a situation of at least starting your planning and starting your opportunity mm -hmm. for discussion. And I know if I'm walking into a, a potential deal and I'm way overvalued at what they do, my line of questioning the first few times I'm going to sit with this target is going to be very different than if it's the other way. If 
I'm coming up with a lot less than what this guy is doing because I'm going to need him to rationalize to my cost, mm -hmm. to my value. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is a lot of it's the negotiating game. It's a little bit like you know the whole discussion of body language and and, and structure. I mean, if you want to come into come into play in my house, I'm going to sit you at my table at my angle the way I want to be because it brings me the confidence and, and the, the understanding. Control, yeah, I don't want to walk into a meeting <clears throat> blind. So again, I'm contextualizing the opportunities by looking at this, okay? Um, the more you do these, the more you get a ballpark and say, okay, it, it kind of makes sense. Um, you know, that you, you can pick up a finance textbook, you can pick up, you know, you can go online on the internet and there's, because uh, I've done it many times, you can go online and, you know, plug in 12 numbers and you can come up with the value of a business based on, uh, you know, based on a whole scenario of a slew with, within an internet form. Right. Okay. Kind of the same idea, but I'm going off the top of my head and I'm taking years of experience and throwing it on the table as well. Again, my goal here is contextualization, putting me into the right framework mm -hmm. in order to find the, the, the right scenario. That's a perfect segue. What you were saying is it, it's kind of the precursor, if you will. Mm -hmm. So once these things get rolling and, and the whether it's, uh, well, I guess in this case, the buyer uh, seems interested in, in pursuing the opportunity, what would you say should be done? Should you have them sign an, if you're the seller, should you have them sign an, an NDA agreement? Um, I, you know, the, the, again, you're right. It's a question of what side of the equation am I on here? Am I buying or am I selling? Uh, certainly if I'm selling and I'm going to the table with anybody that's within my industry, my first fear is, are they working on corporate espionage? Are they trying to find information from me that they're either going to use or take back home when they go back to do. If I'm going to let them in to see my production process, if I'm going to let them in to talk to some of my key employees, I need to be able to have some kind of recourse at the end of the day that prevents them from poaching, mm -hmm. okay, whether that's ideas, whether it's products, whether it's designs, or whether it's people. So yes, the non-disclosure agreement, the NDA, to me is a must. Okay, what it does is it prohibits an individual or an, uh, the other side of the equation from doing just that, poaching information, ideas, and people from your organization. Now, you and I both know that anybody can sign a piece of paper they want, that ultimately at the end of the day, if somebody wants to do that, you still have to enforce it. You're still going to have to take them to court. You're still going to have to fight them. But at least you're starting from a point of strength. Uh, and you are starting from a point of credibility. The other guy knows, hey, at least you know what you're doing at the end of the day. Right. And, and let's so let's say now I, I, I'm the seller. I've signed a well. The purchaser signed an NDA agreement uh, to not disclose any information that I'm divulging. What should I be, and at which point should I be divulging certain information um, before they give me, let's say, a letter of intent, an LOI? So. Again, I'll go back to where I use most of this, which is on the buy side of the equation. So if somebody wants to give me carte blanche up front, I'm going to take it right. as a buyer. I am right. going to take any access to information I can get my hands on. However, if I'm selling, mm -hmm. what I want to be looking at is I want to be providing just enough information to answer the questions that you have. So this first discussion of how I'm going to come up with this calculation, this cocktail nap, and I'm still going to need information from the client. Right. I'm going to need them to provide me with big picture okay, information. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go through the exercise, I'm going to come up with my 1,740 value, and I'm going to have a whole slew of more questions right. okay, that are now then going to have to be dug down further as part of this initial due deal before I get to the real due deal. So if I'm selling, I'm going to give you just enough information to, to whet your appetite to find that spot where you want to still come to the table. I'm not going to give you client lists. I'm not going to give you employee lists. I am not going to give you uh, recipes or uh, molds or you know a, a production process at this first stage. Why? You haven't put anything on the table yet that tells me you're serious. Mm -hmm. Okay, you could be out shopping. So what ends up happening is they a lot of people are all got to kind of sniff around, right? They're they're scratching around looking for truffles in uh, yeah, in the forest, yeah. and and they'll just keep scratching until they find somebody that wants to play a little bit deeper. If they're not willing to sign an NDA, you'll walk. It's the very first rule. If they've signed the NDA and they haven't put the LOI on the table or you haven't given you some sense of a, a deposit, something in the exercise, you're going to turn around and say, I'm going to give it to you a ferry mesure. I'm going to give it to you piece by piece as you need to answer your questions far enough so that you can have some kind of credible big picture 
letter of intent. This is how I see the deal. Okay, and then most deals and most letters of intent are subject to a number of things. The two main ones being subject to financing mm -hmm. and subject to due diligence. Okay, your example of buying a house. When you go to buy a house, what are your conditions? Yeah, your conditions are financing right. in most cases the inspect and the inspection. Well, your inspection equates to your due diligence here. You're going to go in and say, I'm buying the house from you. You've said to me this house is in good order. I'm going to send my people in to check and make sure the house is in good order. No difference in this scenario. Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, we'll certainly put up uh, Jean-Francois Odette's uh, information uh, on, the, on the headline there in the, in the video. And I appreciate your time, Mike. Yeah, I think the, the important thing to add with, with regards to Jean-Francois is we work together on a lot of things where ultimately at the end of the day, you know, he'll do the formal side of the process. I'll look at it a little quicker, making sure we're both on the same page. If we're looking at it on behalf of a client, we will work in tandem together. So I'll kind of get, I need to get us to the table. Right. And then his job is to make sure that it, it makes sense. Absolutely. And I've done the same thing with, with our clients as well and kind of get him involved uh, at a certain stage where, where you can kind of screen the opportunity with the client, uh, depending on the side that it's on. So thank you very much for your time, Mike. Pleasure, thank uh, you. I hope you all enjoyed that. And thanks for tuning in. Don't forget to click the subscribe button and we'll see you next time. Thank you.